Oh, welcome to the second class of the Majestic Symphony School for Human Rights. Uh, tonight we are entering a really important period in South Carolina's history. We've got some excellent speakers this evening. But first I wanted to do a couple housekeeping details. One is that I guess if you're getting our email with a link in it, you're here tonight. Um, we're having some trouble and, and we're being determined. We, we, Google's decided that we're a promotion. And so people are finding their things in the promotion, but I don't need to go on to the difficulties you've had in getting here. And we apologize for technology's complicated nature. But I did want to speak to the, to the song that we just opened with. And it sets up the cinema that we're going to be going into starting with 1800. Dr. Green's going to take us from 1800 to through the Civil War, 1865 in April when it ended. And then we're going to bring in uh, Professor Lewis Burke, uh, who I will introduce shortly when he comes on. An old friend of mine and, and, and quite the scholar as far as uh, the reconstruction of the radical Congress, radical constitution. Right? But the song that we heard first um, was a song that sets up that the, the sentiment that a lot of us that are my age grew up with in terms of the just the spirit of being a rebel and not having anything necessarily to do with anything that we know now retrospectively it does and trying to understand and get into the mind of the people that grew up at leading up to the civil war during the civil war and after the civil war and those really complicated times that we in terms of trying to address the problems that we have inherited from those times we need to understand those dynamics. And so what we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, bring on Dr. Green, who I guess everybody has heard Dr. Green before, but we are absolutely blessed to have Dr. Green as our, our main presenter and our faculty coordinator. Um, I couldn't have made up a more, a more desirable individual if I'd gone to central casting and had them create this role. And so Dr. Robert Green II, uh, please lead us into the 1800s here. Uh, for the Majestic School this evening. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction, Brett. And I'm glad to see everyone here this evening. I hope everyone's having a good Monday so far. Um, and let's go ahead and jump right back into the antebellum period, before the war, as it were, in the 1800s. And then we'll go, of course, right up through the American Civil War. Such a- Dr. Green, I'm sorry. I, I was supposed to, excuse me, I was supposed to do a little bit of housekeeping to tell people that are new to the thing, that they can chat with each other with the chat button down there. They can chat to everyone or they can chat to Robert. And Robert will be taking questions up until the time that we answer your questions after Dr. After Professor Burke speaks. And Robert has the amazing ability to be able to catalog all this in his mind. And the other thing is, is that the reactions thing that if you, if you wanna speak or do something, you can use one of the reaction tools. And uh, Robert, I apologize. I was supposed to do that before you started to talk. Go for it. And oh, you, no another, thing, another thing, you can minimize your screen and see just Dr. Green when he's talking. And so we're, we're, if you're in gallery view, as I am now, I'm seeing, I'm seeing Marjorie eating a dinner and I'm seeing other people doing stuff. But you can, you can punch speaker view. And now I just see a few people in Dr. Green. And that's much better for his presentation. Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm muting myself now. <laughs> Uh, no problem at all. And uh, again, I'm glad to see everyone here this evening. Uh, I, I'm not sure you want to really see my face. I've been told I have a voice for radio and a face for it too. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, talking about the antebellum period. So last time we met on last Monday, I finished up by talking about the role of the Haitian Revolution on South Carolina. And that was a, a really good segue into the 1800s. Of course, the Haitian Revolution being one of the most pivotal events in the history really of the world, if you think about it, since the age of the enlightenment going forward. Um, but now we're gonna really look at how so much is happening in South Carolina uh, in the early 19th century, leading of course up until the Civil War. Now, one thing I always tell students of mine, whether it's at Claflin, at USC or in a Majestic School is that you don't want to make the mistake of assuming that the American Civil War was automatic, that everything that built up to the war uh, was seen in the eyes of people living in that time period as this is gonna lead to the Civil War. With that said, there were many Americans during the 19th century who were deeply concerned about the direction the country was going in North and South, albeit for varied reasons. One of the joys of history is understanding that people living in those time periods 
may not recognize what's coming up over the horizon. Uh, one of the horrors of studying history is realizing that very same thing. Uh, and so this is something that we should also take into consideration as we think about our own activism, our own work in the here and now, that you just don't know what's coming over the horizon. Now, of course, the big, big issue in American politics in the 19th century, really up until the end of the Civil War, of course, is slavery, the institution of slavery. And as we discussed last week, already with the Constitutional Convention and debates amongst abolitionists and pro-slavery forces in the, eight, in the 1780s and 1790s, there is already a sense amongst many national leaders that slavery, if it isn't an issue for the country at the beginning of the 19th century, it will certainly become one as time goes forward. Now keep this in mind, for many slaveholders and many defenders of the institution of slavery, their biggest concern was how do we keep slavery going? How do we keep this institution running? Because after all, by 1800, it was certainly the heart of the economies of many of the Southern states. There was also a fear that if slavery were not allowed a chance to expand, whether it be into the Caribbean or westward into territory owned by Spain, or Mexico, then slavery would eventually die out. So you have to understand, and we'll get into this some today, that the ideology of many slaveholders and defenders of slavery is an ideology of expansion, that you need more land to keep slavery going. This is especially true once cotton becomes the central crop of many slaveholders across the South in the 1790s and going into the 19th century. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 makes cotton a much more profitable crop uh, it becomes a crop that is a staple of many slaveholders across the South. But the problem with cotton is that it's very soil intensive and of course labor intensive. And so you need more soil, more fertile fresh soil to keep growing cotton. Now, ironically enough, uh, with cotton as a crop, for example, uh, there was a choice slaveholders had. They could plant cotton some of the time and then plant other products like foodstuffs, et cetera, to replenish the soil. But that wasn't quite as profitable as just exhausting the soil uh, to grow more and more cotton. So you, you're already seeing slaveholders making critical economic decisions that are going to drive the expansion of slavery southward and westward during the course of the 19th century. And the map you see on the screen before you is actually showing the first major national crisis over slavery, which was the debate over whether or not Missouri should come into the Union as a free state or a slave state in 1819. I'll make a long story short, it is eventually brought in as a slave state uh, with the compromise reached that Maine we brought in as a free state in 1820. And more importantly, you see in the center of the screen, the Missouri Compromise Line, 3630 parallel. It's drawn up by Congress, which is a line basically saying any land south of this line will be slave territory and any land north of this line will be free territory. Um, at least that's the idea in 1819, 1820. Will that compromise last? We'll see, but I think you can probably guess, uh, probably not. Meanwhile, closer to home in South Carolina, as we've already discussed last week, the institution of slavery in South Carolina for many slaveholders always seems to be really lying on the precipice of disaster. Uh, many South Carolinian leaders are saying that slavery is important and essential to not just their economy, but their way of life. But by 1822, there were already concerns over several plots at slave uprisings. You have plots in Columbia in 1805, in Camden and Ashpoo in 1816 as well. And so you're already seeing in South Carolina this concern about the potential for slave revolts across the state. And all of these, of course, predate a slave revolt or a slave revolt that many of us are aware of, which is, of course, the Denmark VC conspiracy of the 1820s. Now, the thing about Denmark VC that I want to talk about before we get into the actual conspiracy is that VC himself was born into slavery, uh, but eventually he was able to purchase his freedom while winning a lottery. And by 1822 in Charleston, Denmark VC was a pretty well known free person of color. Uh, his services as a carpenter were sought out by many in the community. Uh, he was also a founding member of an AME church in Charleston, which of course would become the Mother Emanuel AME church. But in 1822, uh, rumors were abound in Charleston of a potential slave revolt. 
And eventually the authorities discovered that this conspiracy centered around uh, Denmark VC. Now, the thing with the lottery really quickly, not to get too much into detail about that, but the lottery that VC won uh, was essentially, it, it's somewhat like a lottery you have today where people, uh, they, they pay to get into the lottery, they have a winning ticket. Um, VC, and the thing about slavery in Charleston is this, it is a form of urban slavery where the enslaved have a few more, and I don't want to go too far into this, but a few more rights and privileges than the enslaved on, say, a rural plantation in, say, the upstate of South Carolina. In Charleston, if you were enslaved and you were a slave working in an urban environment, you may have more contact with free people of color. You may have more interaction with the local economy. You may have a chance, as VC did, to make some money on the side, put enough money to, to enter a lottery, and then, as luck would have it for him, to win your freedom. And that's how VC is able to win his freedom. He wins the lottery, pays a slave owner uh, to be free, and he is a free person of color after that. But this is actually what makes VC such an interesting threat to the authorities in Charleston, is that he was a free person of color who was born into slavery, and thus he still had any contacts with enslaved people all over Charleston. And there were two individuals who informed the authorities of a potential slave conspiracy here, uh, being led by VC. And the enslaved who informed the authorities were concerned that if the conspiracy were actually attempted and it failed, then of course the enslaved in Charleston, including those who had nothing to do with the conspiracy, would of course be punished and potentially executed for their role in the conspiracy. Now the conspiracy is figured out by the authorities. VC and over 130 others are arrested by folks in Charleston. Um, 31 of them at least are executed. Many others are sold elsewhere uh, to be enslaved elsewhere. A VC himself is of course executed, but it is an attempt at a slave conspiracy that if it had actually gone off, could have overwhelmed the authorities in Charleston. It, it's hard to imagine how an uprising in Charleston in 1822 would have gone, but it is important to note that authorities in South Carolina have been concerned for decades by this point about the potential for a slave uprising. Now, as a result of Denmark VC's conspiracy in 1822, uh, the legislature in South Carolina passes several acts designed to further constrict the movement and the freedom of not just the enslaved, but even free people of color. Uh, by the end of the 1820s, of course, the state legislature passes the Siemens Act, uh, which was basically an act designed to curtail the movement of any free blacks coming into Charleston from ships coming to Charleston Harbor. So how does Siemens Act work was like this. If you were a black sailor on any ship that called the port of Charleston, you stopped at Charleston, if you were a black person, the only thing you were allowed to do was to go straight to the jail in Charleston and to stay there for the duration of your ship's stay. Now, as is a tradition in South Carolina, the federal government did not like this because it endangered trade with other countries, many of which employ black sailors on their ships as a, a matter of fact. Um, and so the federal government pressured the state government of South Carolina to amend or change the Siemens Act over time because of concerns that it can cause an international incident. Also, if you were a free black person in South Carolina by the end of the 1820s, what's happening is that the state legislature is basically asking you to find white people to vouch on your behalf that you are actually a good black person who will not foment or cause any slave revolts. So even if you're a free black person in South Carolina, your rights are severely curtailed, severely curtailed. And as was pointed out in the chat, a big reason for this is that by the 1820s, the population of South Carolina is majority black, most of whom are enslaved. And so a, a slave revolt in South Carolina could be particularly disastrous for the plantation elite. Now, the thing about uh, slavery in South Carolina, of course, is that and this is really important for the Justice School as a whole, is that the state of South Carolina is really the birthplace of some of the most important reactionary politicians in American history. Of course, some of you, some of them you already know quite well, like your, your Strong Thurmans, your James Burns, your Ben Tillmans. But before any of those guys come on the scene, of course, you have John C. Calhoun. Now, the thing about Calhoun is 
his early career as a politician, you wouldn't assume that he's going to become the ardent states rights advocate that he does. Early on in his career, the 18 teens and 1820s, Calhoun starts out as, as you see on the screen, an ardent nationalist, which in this context means he's actually for a strong central federal government. He's in favor of internal improvements, building up infrastructure. He's also in favor, and again, it's tied to slavery, a, a strong and aggressive foreign policy. Remember, in the 18-teens, the United States still has on its borders the Spanish in Florida, uh, the British was on the modern Midwest, and of course, various indigenous tribes throughout North America as well. All these groups are seen as really impediments to national expansion, and Calhoun is highly aggressive in pushing westward and southward expansion for the young United States. He's a congressman during the War of 1812, becomes Secretary of War for several terms, and even becomes Vice President of the United States. Uh, first under John Quincy Adams, who if you've not read about Adams and you are really interested in abolitionism and reading about genuine American heroes, you should read about John Quincy Adams, and then becomes Vice President to Andrew Jackson shortly after that. Now, the thing about Calhoun, and this is an issue that many South Carolina politicians face, is that to be a politician from South Carolina, you can either seek national fame and become a national figure, but risk losing your support at home in South Carolina. Or on the flip side, you can become a beloved figure in South Carolina, a major leader in South Carolina, but at the same time, lose the ability to be a true national leader, a true contender, say, for the presidency or some other high office. This is what I would call the Palmetto Faustian bargain. You can either be famous nationally and lose support at home or be famous at home and have strong support in South Carolina, but not really become a national figure who can rise beyond the borders of South Carolina. Calhoun initially is able to thread the needle between satisfying his constituents in South Carolina and being a national political player. But by 1832, this position will no longer be tenable. And this is because in the 1820s and early 1830s, more and more South Carolinians and really Southerners in general are beginning to come around to the idea of what's called the nullification theory, which is I think something some of you have heard about before in contemporary political and social discourse. Like everything else, it has a history. Essentially, the nullification theory says that a state can actually override whatever law a federal, the federal government passes. It's a, a certain viewpoint of the Constitution of the United States, which gives a bit more power to the states than the Constitution actually outright states. But Southerners like Calhoun increasingly favored nullification theory. Publicly, they were saying it was because of things like the tariffs of 1824 and 1828. Now, really quickly, you mentioned the tariffs for two seconds. I know this is not the sexiest topic in the world, but one reason why Southerners are so anti-tariff is that they prefer purchasing tools and products for their enslaved to use in their plantations from the cheapest source possible. Whereas Northern politicians are much more concerned with protective tariffs designed to protect Northern industry from foreign competition. So as you can see, even things like tariffs are tied back to the institution of slavery. And in fact, Calhoun himself admitted that by 1832, when South Carolina is first threatening to leave the Union over the question of the tariff of 1828, Calhoun admits publicly that, quote, that this is, quote, the occasion rather than the real cause of the present unhappy state of things. Now, what does that mean? What Calhoun's really saying, and what most Southerners were saying when they were supporting the nullification theory, is that their concern is not about the tariff. Their concern is, if the federal government has the power to do this, then what's to say down the road that they can't have the power to abolish slavery, or at least severely curtail its growth? Really for Calhoun and many of the leaders in South Carolina and across the South, their biggest concern is making sure that over time, the federal government does not gain the power to destroy slavery. I wanna go back a few slides just to quickly explain why they're thinking this already. If you look at this map very quickly, once again, 
And you look at the fact that in 1820, the Missouri Compromise Line is only giving Southerners territory in what's Arkansas and soon to be Oklahoma. And you look north of that, Southerners are already thinking, well, wait a minute. If we stop expansion westward at where we are at the moment in 1820, then we risk having more in the long run, more free states than slave states in Congress. And this will be especially important in the US Senate. So really, there is always this concern during the 19th century among Southerners that in the long run, thanks to demographics, thanks to the changing shape of the country, thanks to this Missouri Compromise, that in the long run, the South is going to lose out on the ability to not only expand slavery, but to even defend where it already exists in the Southern states. Now, what's really important about the nullification crisis of 1832 is that South Carolina is really on its own. The rest of the South does not agree to support the nullification idea, mainly because they really want to wait and see how Andrew Jackson and future federal administrations deal with the question of slavery. And so South Carolina uh, threatens to, to not uh, really enforce the tariff. Andrew Jackson, being the president that he is, uh, says, well, if you want to enforce a tariff, I'll send troops into South Carolina who will. South Carolina, not being led by idiots, decides to step down. But in the aftermath of the nullification crisis, the state legislature does pass a resolution saying, we still think we in South Carolina have the right to nullify federal law no matter what President Jackson or anyone else says. And again, this conflict between Calhoun and Jackson, I know what a lot of people are probably thinking, this is like the Freddy Krueger versus Jason Voorhees of American history here. Uh, and you're kind of right in a lot of ways. But nonetheless, it does show that South Carolina only has so much power in the national level that other Southern states at this moment are not ready to go behind them and support whatever they want to do. And in fact, Calhoun has to step down from the vice presidency in 1832, and he returns to South Carolina and becomes, resumes being a senator from the state uh, during the nullification crisis. And so Calhoun sacrifices the vice presidency to resume representing South Carolina. And for the rest of his life, until he passes away in 1850, he is going to be a stalwart South Carolinian in the Senate and a stalwart champion of states' rights. And many of our ideas of states' rights nullification come from John C. Calhoun. In fact, there's a new biography of Calhoun that just came out. I can't remember the author's name right now, but if you look it up online, you can find it pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's a big brick of a book, but it's also, it looks really interesting. I've heard some great reviews of it. Uh, certainly John C. Calhoun's one of those individuals that it's hard to think of American history without thinking of him. Now, I do also wanna very quickly talk about the ideas behind slavery because as important as it is to understand how folks like Calhoun are defending slavery on a national level, it's also important to understand how individuals like James Henry Hammond, who was a politician from South Carolina in the 1830s and 40s as well, are also justifying the institution of slavery. Now, let's take a step back to the 18th century for a moment during the revolutionary era. At that time, slavery was seen by most as a necessary evil. That's how Thomas Jefferson described it. He says, well, it's, it's unfortunate we have these enslaved Africans among us, but hey, they're here, they should do work for us. This is what they're, they're built and bred to do. Um, as though the enslaved just fell out of the sky one day and they were like, oh, you're an enslaved people. But this is how they justified slavery in the 18th century. However, James Henry Hammond presents a theory that shows how white Southerners are thinking about slavery differently. The ideology behind slavery changes generation to generation and century to century. As you will soon see, the ideology behind racism changes from generation to generation as well, and justification for it changes over time. Hammond makes the argument in the 1830s of what he calls the mud sill theory. The mudsill being this idea that if you build a house, for instance, any sort of structure, it has to have a mudsill upon which the house or structure is built. And Hammond's mudsill theory is exactly what you think it is. He's arguing that enslaved Africans are the mudsill 
upon which everything else in American society has to be built. And part of his justification is that he tells his listeners and voters in South Carolina and across the South, well, how can we criticize slavery if it worked for the ancient Greeks and Romans? Greek societies had slaves, Roman society had slaves, and as Americans, who do we look to for inspiration? The Greeks and the Romans. If it was good enough for them, then certainly it must be good enough for us. Now, this mudsill theory is important because it also represents a hardening of the attitudes towards slavery amongst many white Southerners. And during the course of the 19th century, you're going to see more and more Southerners transition from an idea of slavery as necessary evil to thinking of slavery as a positive good, both for themselves as white people and also for the enslaved Africans, because in their eyes, the Africans are only good for enslavement. This is gonna also make compromise over the issue of slavery more and more difficult. Now within South Carolina, of course, it was very difficult to stand up against slavery. Of course, the enslaved themselves are the most ardent critics of slavery wanting to be free. And as you may have seen in one of your readings for this afternoon's class, um, you also have maroons, uh, slaves who are fleeing into various parts of South Carolina, most notably into the Congaree or the Low Country, other parts of the state that are very difficult to traverse and navigate. These Maroons are often living off the land and really becoming seen by many white South Carolinians as the scourge of the state because the government is having a really hard time finding them. And in fact, the state government in South Carolina's main priority from 1800 until 1865 is to make sure that slavery as an institution is A, kept intact, and, that any, and B, any threat to slavery, whether it be abolitionists, maroons, slave uh, conspiracies, et cetera, that any of these threats are neutralized as quickly and as effectively as possible. Of course, folks like the Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, they represent what many South Carolinians also fear, which is white resistance to slavery in the form of the abolitionist movement. Now, the Grimke sisters, of course, came from a slave holding family, but they themselves could not countenance or justify or really tolerate the institution of slavery. Now, the thing about the Grimke sisters that you have to remember is that not only are the sisters opposed to slavery, but once they actually get involved in the abolitionist movement, again, they have to move to Philadelphia to really get involved in it. In the abolitionist movement, they find out that as women, they are also not terribly welcome to speak up against the institution of slavery. And so the Grimke sisters actually represent something that becomes a recurring theme in the history of radicalism and activism in American life, which is if you are a person who is from an oppressed group, whether you're a person of color, a woman, the LGBT community, et cetera, you may face pushback within activist movements that you're involved in. And certainly women in the 19th century who were becoming involved in the abolitionist movement are also facing pushback uh, simply for being women and speaking out against these issues. And this is gonna become one of the catalyzing factors in the women's rights movement of the 19th century, ultimately leading to the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Yeah, I mean, they certainly were amazing. And again, I think they're an example of how we have to be careful when we say things like, oh, you know, you can't apply the thinking of today on the past. Um, because I think there's an assumption that everyone in the past thought the exact same way, and that couldn't be further from the truth. One of the things that makes things like the mudsill theory so interesting, after all, is that the fact that Southerners were having to theorize a justification for slavery shows that they knew deep down they had to find not only political, but also moral justifications for what they were doing. So keep that in mind, too. Now, the thing about slavery, again, as I mentioned before, is that westward expansion becomes for many Americans the critical foreign policy objective of the 19th century. But they're doing it for different reasons. Northern politicians generally support westward expansion because they want additional territory for farmers to be able to go to. There's a growing ideology in the North that will become the guiding principle of the Republican Party of free soil, free labor, free men. Whereas, and I'll put them in the chat because that's actually really important. 
Um, whereas in the South, it becomes much more about the expansion of, of territory to satisfy and satiate the appetites of slaveholders. Because again, the plantation elite in the South, they need more land to keep growing cotton and other valuable cash crops. Again, they're exhausting the soil in places like South Carolina. In fact, South Carolina is one of the Southern states that sees a massive, massive amounts of slaveholders actually leaving the state because they so thoroughly exhaust the land in the Midlands, in the low country, in the pursuit of growing cotton. So many slaveholders in South Carolina, for instance, purchase land in Alabama, Mississippi, and they start new plantations there. So you're seeing how South Carolina, as it's becoming more and more important as a defender of slavery on a national level, within the state, the economics of slavery are pushing some to actually go elsewhere to purchase more land to buttress their own gains off of slavery in the Palmetto State. Now, today, if you were to go to the State House grounds, um, you might see amongst other memorials, a memorial to the Mexican War, fought from 1846 to 1848. A war which, even in the 1840s, many Americans felt was little more than a war to expand slavery into Texas and other parts of the West. Um, and by the way, I, I cannot help but note that this weekend was the anniversary of the beginning of the war in Iraq in 2003. Um, and how that conflict was also one started over, well, shall we say questionable pretenses. In 2003, it was WMDs. In 1846, it was the question of whether or not the Mexican and American armies clashed in American territory or Mexican territory. There are many American politicians, including a young Abraham Lincoln, who said, yeah, you know, if you look at this map, it looks like the American army actually entered Mexican territory to start a war on false pretenses. Mexican War itself was actually very controversial at the time. Um, folks like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau spoke out against the war. Abolitionists like Frederick Douglass were also ardently anti-war. John Quincy Adams spoke out earlier against annexing Texas. There was a feeling amongst many Americans that the war was about the expansion of slave territory. And this is why most of the ardent participants in the war were from the South. And so for example, if you go to the State House grounds, you'll see this, this medallion there and this monument to the war, which was dedicated to the Palmetto Regiment, which fought in the Mexican War in 1846 and 1847. Now, the war, of course, was a smashing success for the United States. They were able to defeat Mexico, and the territory of the United States expanded almost really double virtually overnight. But even John C. Calhoun, as art and a champion of slavery as he was, was a bit concerned about how the United States essentially used false pretenses to start a war over annexing Texas and annexing millions of or thousands of miles of other territory owned by Mexico. And he said, quote, the day of retribution will come. And when it does, awful will be the reckoning and heavy the responsibilities somewhere, end quote. Essentially, Calhoun saw what most other folks wanted to ignore, which was westward expansion meant that the debate over slavery, and where it would go, would have to resume in earnest. And this time, there may be no compromise available to anyone. Now, slavery, of course, was a critical national issue up until this point albeit the US Congress tried at various moments to really clamp down on the debate over slavery. For example, in the 1830s, Congress had in place what was called the gag rule, which did not allow for petitions demanding the abolishing of slavery to be entertained on the floor of the house. By the 1850s, that ship had long sailed. With the compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, the US Congress was struggling to admit these new gained territories from Mexico into the United States, first as territories and then as states. For example, the Compromise of 1850 uh, allowed California to become the state as a, as a free state, but also left the issue of other territories up to the future. In the Kansas-Nebraska Act, of course, Congress basically says, you know what, we're going to stop trying to draw lines in the sand, and instead we'll use an idea called popular sovereignty which will allow peoples to move to different territories in the West and they'll vote on whether or not they'll become a free state 
or a slave state. Thinking was you can't get more democratic than that. But in places like Kansas, that turns into a complete and utter disaster. When you announce that people can vote on whether or not a territory can be a free or slave territory based on people vote, then you shouldn't be surprised when folks north and south move to Kansas to decide whether or not it'd be slave or free. And Kansas goes from being a political flashpoint to being an actual guerrilla war, where abolitionists and pro-slavery advocates alike are murdering each other left and right. Most notably, John Brown comes to fame because of his uh, killing of five pro-slavery advocates in Kansas. But this violence, of course, is not limited to Kansas. Um, all across the country, you actually have mobs chasing after abolitionists. Uh, even folks like Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison are attacked by mobs in the 1840s and 1850s, giving anti-slavery speeches. And there is even violence in Congress, which is something that up until this January would have seemed pretty comical and hard to believe, but we've actually seen with our own eyes what that can look like, unfortunately. Now, in this case, in 1856, uh, there is a speech given by Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts, who gives a speech not only destroying the institution of slavery, but calling out South Carolina in particular for its art and defense of slavery. In the gallery is Preston Brooks, who is <coughs> a cousin of the South Carolina senator whom uh, Sumner has attacked and has essentially um, offended. Later on, of course, as Sumner is sitting at his desk writing his next speech, Preston Brooks approaches Sumner and attacks him with a cane. As you can see here in this um, Northern political cartoon that's titled Southern Chivalry Arguments versus Clubs. Now Sumner is so badly beaten that he is basically out of the Senate for close to two years, needing time to recover from his many injuries. Brooks meanwhile is seen as a hero in the South and there are actually hundreds of clubs, uh, and, excuse me, hundreds of canes delivered to his office in Congress as a show of thanks from Southerners for his attack on Sumner. Again, things are getting worse and worse in the country in the 1850s. And I, again, I wanna make it clear that folks don't see the Civil War coming, but there is this foreboding sense that something's gonna happen sooner or later. Now, I've talked a lot about how public opinion in the South is being galvanized in defense of slavery. But at the same time, in the northern states, the so-called free states, anti-slavery opinion is also being galvanized, often in response to actions by Southerners, response to bleeding Kansas. And the breaking point for many Northerners is the Dred Scott case of 1857. Very quickly, uh, the Dred Scott case is where Dred Scott, an enslaved person, sues for his freedom. It goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, under Justice Roger Tawney, actually rules that well, okay, so Dred Scott, you were brought to a free territory, Wisconsin. And the idea was, at least according to the Constitution, was that if free people were brought to, or rather if slaves were brought to a free territory, they're automatically free, right? This is the, the idea behind uh, free states, behind free territories, behind all these ideas in the Constitution that have been upheld by Congress for decades. Justice Tony says, well, actually, if you're an enslaved person, and you're brought to a free territory like Wisconsin. Actually, if we're thinking about ideas of private property, then you're still enslaved no matter where you are. Furthermore, Justice Tony goes a step further and decides that as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, he is going to once and for all decide the slavery question for all Americans by saying that actually, if you're Black in this country, you have zero rights that we are bound to respect. And so between that and the idea that the enslaved can be brought anywhere in the country, many white Northerners who had previously not really cared about the slavery issue suddenly realized, wait, if I live in Ohio or Pennsylvania or New York or Massachusetts or Michigan, slaveholders can come up here with their slaves and just do whatever they want. And there's even a fear that this basically means the entire country is now a slaveocracy. It infuriates thousands of white Northerners. It galvanizes the Republican Party. And it even gives the abolitionist movement a boost that it so desperately needed in the late 1850s. Okay. Wow, wow is exactly right. Um, and so 
really the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, the final moment that pushes us to secession is really two things. Uh, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, which is his attempt to get weapons to arm enslaved Africans in Virginia. The actual attempt fails, but in the process, many Southerners are stunned by how many white Northerners actually publicly support John Brown. And then B, the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 as the Republican nominee for president is really what pushes Southerners to go ahead and support secession. Now, the Republican Party in 1860 proclaimed time and again, we are not trying to attack slavery where it already exists. But they do want to keep slavery where it is. and They don't want to see it expand any further into the territories. For many white Southerners, that was enough. And once Lincoln wins, by the way, with only 40% of the popular vote, but winning virtually the entire North in the process, Southerners begin to realize their worst fears have come true. There is an anti-slavery party that can win the entire North and in the process, use their electoral strength to potentially threaten slavery. And this is what pushes South Carolina and eventually 10 other Southern states to between December of 1860 and April 1861 to secede from the Union. And towards the seat of Charleston merge to recover, the Union is dissolved. Okay, um, and I want to very, you know, I know I'm, I'm running out of time for my part, but what I want to do now is just uh, very quickly get into the Civil War. This won't take more than a few minutes because um, the Civil War in South Carolina, of course, is a very interesting topic. Um, we, could spend, we could spend all night talking about it, but I'm gonna just really hit the highlights because the Civil War in South Carolina it's certainly important because of some of the battles that were fought here. What's more important is that you're starting to see the seeds of the social and political revolution that we call Reconstruction starting in the state as early as 1861. Okay. Now, of course, the war actually begins in South Carolina uh, with the Confederate firing at Fort Sumter in April 1861. Now, the time the war begins, most Americans on both sides agree on just two things. Number one, the war won't take longer, longer than a few months to have one big battle, and that'll be it. Number two, everyone's publicly proclaiming, whatever happens in this civil war, we will not touch the institution of slavery. Now, A, of course, was wrong because eventually over 800,000 Americans would die in the war. And B was also definitely wrong because both sides began to realize that because the South was fighting to preserve slavery, the institution itself either had to be strengthened on the Confederate part or had to be destroyed on the part of the federal government in order for victory to be obtained. Now, November of 1861, as both sides are marshaling their forces for what they soon realized to be a long drawn out war, the Federal Navy actually attacks Port Royal, South Carolina. You see a, a rendering of the bombardment of Port Royal in November of 1861. Now, the idea here was to get a foothold in the state to allow for potential attacks all up and down the coastline, especially towards Charleston. But, and here's another map of, of the area, but what's really interesting is that when Port Royal falls in that area near Beaufort Falls to Federal forces, Federal troops land on the coast and they realize that while there are thousands, about 10,000 enslaved Africans here, all of their slave masters have fled further inland. Now, remember this, in 1861, there is not yet a federal policy about what to do with the enslaved who happen to be owned by Confederate slave masters once they're captured by federal troops. There is not yet an Emancipation Proclamation. There is not yet any sort of um, confiscation acts. Uh, there's no idea of contraband, for example. And so the federal troops are really having to make policy on the fly, essentially, while at the same time trying not to alienate more moderate whites in the north and those in the uh, border states that have, not, that have not yet left the Union, like Kentucky, Maryland, and so forth. However, the federal troops at Port Royal in conjunction with the federal government back in Washington, D.C., decide to see what would happen if the formerly enslaved people of Port Royal are allowed to live and work essentially on their own with some supervision 
from primarily New Englanders who are coming down south to also see how this experiment of freedom will work. And this, of course, is known as the Port Royal Experiment, where thousands of formerly enslaved Africans are, for the first time in their lives, allowed the opportunity to live and work off the land as they see fit. And here's a photograph, this is from around 1862 or so, of some of the enslaved along with a few Union soldiers um, near the Port Royal area. Now, what happens in Port Royal is that you have, for example, abolitionists from New England who come down to teach them how to read and write. But also, what's equally important is that many of those abolitionists also want to push the, the recently enslaved peoples into a capitalist economy. They're trying to encourage them to not only grow crops and support themselves, but to grow enough crops to become part of this worldwide economic system. Now, what we do know about the Port Royal experiment is that while many African-Americans living in Port Royal, of course, do prefer to be free rather than being a slave for obvious reasons, there is also some pushback from them about what they want. They really, while they appreciate the education being offered and the training being offered by abolitionists and by federal troops, the Blacks in Port Royal also make it quite clear that they have their own dreams and desires for what they want, namely to be left alone by the rest of society. This is something that the abolitionists are surprised by, and you're already seeing some friction between Black Americans living in Port Royal and the abolitionists who've come down to help them. And I think for those of us in the group who are interested in activism, this is an especially important lesson. Even if you're going to help another group of people who you see as being oppressed, you want to offer your allyship, your assistance, make sure you're actually listening to what they want first before you plant your own ideas or own ideology onto what you believe they will want to. So keep that in mind. Okay. Now, and again, so many of these topics are such rich topics that could be lectures on their own. Uh, again, if you've not read the material on the Justice School website, I would recommend doing so as soon as you can because there's a lot more about some of these topics on there um, as well. Okay. Now, I'm making a very, very, very long story short about the Civil War. Uh, and I could spend all night talking about the war, talking about the battles at the end of the war and so forth. But to uh, fast forward, essentially, from 1861 to 1864, after over three and a half years of war, the Confederacy begins to realize one very important thing. If your entire way of life is based upon slavery, based upon selling cotton, it's a little difficult to fight a war against an industrialized power to your north, namely the federal government. It's also hard to fight said war if you're struggling to feed yourself, to clothe yourself, to arm yourself with weapons. But most important, the Confederacy also realizes that not every white Southerner supports the war effort either. In fact, over 100,000 white Southerners fight for the federal side in the Civil War. At the same time, the concern about a major enemy in their midst, namely the enslaved themselves, also forces Confederate leaders to keep thousands of troops in the rear to be used, to be used potentially against possible slave revolts. Now, by 1864, after a series of defeats at Antietam, Gettysburg, and elsewhere, and after Sherman's march to the sea in the fall of 1864, the end looks quite near for the Confederacy and in particularly South Carolina. Now, up until the end of 1864, there wasn't really much fighting in the state of South Carolina beyond, of course, the Port Royal experiment, the assault on Battery Wagner in 1863, which was immortalized in the film Glory, and the like. Um, most of the fighting had been in low country in that area near Charleston. But what you're beginning to see by 1864 is that the Union Army under General William T. Sherman is massing in Savannah and their next target is South Carolina itself. Now keep in mind, many federal troops relish the opportunity to take the fight to South Carolina because to many of them, they saw South Carolina as being the state that started this whole damn war in the first place with their secession in 1860. And so, make the long story short, the federal troops are a bit eager to enter the Palmetto State and to make Columbia, shall we say, famously hot. 
And so the photo you see here is after the fall of Columbia in February of 1865. Uh, around the same time, Charleston also falls to federal troops as well. Now, South Carolina's collapse is rapid because again, most of the, the forces that will defend the state are actually fighting in Northern Virginia. They're, they're gonna surrender Appomattox in April of 1865. Um, but what happens is that the state government has a hard time marshaling forces. They get about 20,000 troops to face off against Sherman, Sherman 60,000. And most of those troops are young boys or old men, not really in fighting condition to actually hold off a federal invasion. At the same time, the state's infrastructure is also collapsing. Again, there are increased reports of enslaved Africans leaving their plantations. Um, they're just walking off in mass, refusing to work. Um, in W.B. Du Bois's 1935 work, Black Reconstruction in America, he actually makes an argument that the Civil War was won by the North partially because of what he referred to as a general strike amongst enslaved Africans across the South. Over 500,000 enslaved Africans flee to freedom during the course of the war, quite a few of whom end up taking up arms for the federal government in regiments like the 54th Massachusetts, the 1st South Carolina Volunteers, so on and so forth. Over 200,000 African Americans actually fight for the federal government during the Civil War, quite a few of whom were enslaved before or even during the war themselves. And of course, this is also a photo from Charleston in 1865. Now keep in mind, as I've said before, South Carolina's economy was built entirely on the institution of slavery. And now in 1865, following the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, that institution is now gone. So the question becomes, as most of the state is in ruins, as thousands of South Carolinians are either dead or returning home maimed, seriously injured, scarred by the ravages of war, there comes a new question. What is South Carolina going to look like without slavery? What is the state going to look like now that the institution of slavery that, that it has defended for so long has been completely and utterly destroyed? And what does this look like in a state that is, by the way, majority Black? These are the questions that will plague South Carolinians and become part and parcel of larger federal policy during the era that we refer to as Reconstruction. Okay, so um, I want to now go ahead and turn the floor over uh, to Dr. Lewis Burke, uh, that's all right with everyone else. Um, who will discuss the Reconstruction period and especially South Carolina's really intriguing, unique role in that era of American history. That was a rousing tune to bring uh, Professor Burke on to talk about the, the Union coming to free the slaves in South Carolina and that the anguish that was um, pretty much prevalent amongst all the white folks because their life was changing in a serious fashion. And uh, that tune captures maybe some of the spirit that offsets the spirit we heard earlier from the Dixie tune. Uh, we'll close with a tune that uh, sums up the remorse that leads into the uh, long struggle to reclaim the lost cause. But I wanna tell you that, that Lewis Burke is somebody that I've known uh, for I think 40 more, more than 40 years. And um, knew him as a Vista and a, a liberal and yeah, he didn't just grow up and go to law school and became the uh, director of clinics, uh, legal clinics. He became a uh, dean, uh, associate dean of administration of the School of Law in 1992. Uh, he also was the affiliate faculty of the USC uh, African-American studies in 202 to 208. Uh, and retired from the law school as a distinguished professor emeritus. Some people know him as Lewis, but we'll call him distinguished professor. And uh, he, he's, he has authored a book that uh, I think really does a profound capture of the power of the only body in the nation's history in a legislative circumstance where the, the South Carolina House of Representatives was majority black in it. 
1868. And so Lewis is going to take us through the end of the Civil War, where the where the presidential the presidential Reconstruction and the radical Reconstruction. And um, I'm going to lift up Lewis's book at Freedom Door: African American Founding Fathers and Lawyers in Reconstruction, in South Carolina. And to think of the African Americans being founding fathers opens the, the your mind to the notion that the Constitution of 1868 was the most democratic ever done. And Lewis is going to enlighten you on that. He's also written a book about Matthew Perry, The Dawn of Religious Freedom, what, wrote one called Madam Chief Justice about Jean, Jean Toll, who was the Chief Justice here. And at, um, at the law school, they've given Lewis a, uh, a website. That we sent you a link earlier, but it's all for civil rights. I'll put the link in the, in the chat box where you can go and you can actually see in an alphabetical order or chronological order, the uh, black, black leadership that has been involved in running our government since um, they were allowed to be involved in our government. And um, I'm gonna bring on Lewis now, but I do wanna also mention that uh, we have a former representative and the honorable judge, uh, Seth Whipper with us. And, um, and we're gonna hear this, Seth is waving, there he is. And Seth is somebody that I worked with, with Gilda Tom Hunter and Joe Neal, where we established the Progressive Network in 92, 94. And, um, and Seth is finishing out a wonderful opportunity of being an administrator of justice in Charleston. I told him, I hope I get arrested in Charleston before he retires. And so Lewis, bring, on, bring, bring it on and, and let us know about uh, W.J. Whipper, Seth's, one of Seth's great, great something. Thank you, sir. Take it, Lewis. Well, thank you, Brett. Um, I won't tell you all the place that I met Brett. Uh, he can uh, enlighten you all about our early days together. The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery was passed by Congress in January of 1865. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, 1865. And then it would have been Lincoln's reconstruction of the South, and we don't know what that would have been. Because on April 14th, Lincoln was assassinated. Despite the surrender, with the reconstruction under the leadership then of President Andrew Johnson, South Carolina's whites were not going to accept freedom for the black majority of the state. Johnson's plan allowed the Southern states to reorganize their governments to be readmitted to the Union. And in September of 1865, a convention composed solely of white men met in Columbia and promulgated a new state constitution to comply with the requirements of Johnson's reconstruction plan. That convention had two obligations under that plan. They had to declare secession null and void and adopt a constitution that recognized the abolition of slavery. Though the convention did agree to repeal the articles of secession, it refused to declare them null and void. Likewise, the convention only grudgingly acknowledged that the United States authorities had emancipated the slaves. When African-Americans in Charleston tried to get an audience with the convention, they were rebuffed. The convention adopted a new constitution that only allowed white men to vote and white men to hold office. The all-white convention authorized the governor to appoint two commissioners to draft a black code to regulate the colored population of the state. In November of 1865, the Colored People's Convention was held in Charleston. This was a South Carolina group to voice opposition to this new constitution. And they requested that the federal government uh, reject the new constitution's restrictions on the right to vote and condemn the proposed black codes. In their final resolution of their convention, they called upon the state legislature to recognize the famous words of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. In the meantime, the all white legislature ignored these concerns and enacted the black codes, which were modeled after the old slave codes and were nothing more than a veiled attempt to re-enslave African-Americans. The black codes denied social and political equality and freedom of movement to any person of color. Blacks were not permitted to be absent from the farms where they worked without permission of the master. Those are the words of the, stat of the code. They could not join the militia nor own a gun. A separate court system was established for Blacks, and they could only testify in cases affecting persons or property of other persons of color. 
They were even limited in how they could earn a living. The Black Code provided that no person of color shall pursue or practice the art trade or business of an artisan, mechanic, or shopkeeper, or any other trade, employment, or business on his own account without a license by a court. Of course, whites did not have to seek court permission to engage in any trade or job. Similar codes were passed across the South, and soon the federal government reacted. In January 1, 1866, General Daniel Sickles, a military commander of South Carolina, issued an order abrogating the Black Code. And Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which defined all persons born in the United States as citizens. And of course, that was constitutionalized with the 14th Amendment in June of 1866. With the Reconstruction Plan of Congress was then adopted in early 1867. This act required the Southern states to enact constitutions that complied with the United States Constitution and provided full manhood suffrage. Under the Reconstruction Act, an absolute majority of all registered voters had to cast an affirmative vote in favor of calling a constitutional convention. The white Democratic leaders urged whites to register and then boycott the election, hoping that it would fail to achieve the absolute majority required. The blacks registered and voted in unprecedented numbers. Eric Foner described that election day as follows. In defiance of fatigue, hardship, hunger, and threats of employers, with tattered clothes without shoes, the former slaves stood in line to vote, motivated by the hunger to have the same chances as the white men. In the end, 80% of the black men voted. I doubt we've had such a turnout in any election since. The convention was approved on January 14, 1868. 76 black and 48 white delegates assembled to draft a new constitution. Two months later, they approved the final draft on March 17. The South Carolina State Constitution was a remarkable document. Some early historians tried to claim that the Constitution was written by white men, but the record is clear that black delegates such as Francis Cardozo, Jonathan Jasper Wright, Robert Brown Elliott, Benjamin Randolph, William Hipper were the leaders of the convention and the drafters. They made and debated sophisticated provisions on numerous issues. New York Times reported that the delegates, the black delegates were the best debaters in the body. Universal public education was established. Payment of the poll tax was no longer a prerequisite to voting. The property holding qualification for public office was eliminated. The General Assembly was appointed, apportioned on the basis of population. The new constitution abolished debtor's prison. And because Andrew Jackson had killed 40 acres and a mule, they established a land commission to help distribute land to the former slaves in South Carolina. The most important section was Article 8, which provided that every male citizen 21 years of age or older without distinction of race, color, or former condition was entitled to vote. As the convention finished its debates on the wording of the franchise section, William J. Whipper rose and made a motion that the word male be stricken and the words every citizen be substituted. Whipper said governments will, will continue to totter and fall until the rights of all parties are respected, womankind as well as mankind. This system of government never will be permanent until women are recognized as equal of men. Whipper was quite serious. He may have been influenced, or he was influenced, by Frances Rollin, who became his wife later. Frances Rollin, along with her sister Charlotte, were major uh, women advocates in the state. They even appeared before the state legislature. They organized the Women's Suffrage Association and held a convention of women in the state during Reconstruction. Whipper's motion was decided in the negative. However, the convention did pass another important advance in women's rights by allowing married women to hold property in their own name. Previously, a married woman's property became her husband's upon marriage. The convention had produced a document intended to protect civil rights, making it the most egalitarian legal instrument in the state's history. This set the stage for the real revolution that followed. For the first time in South Carolina history, the Constitution was put before the voters for approval. 
and elections were held on the same, the same day for state and local offices. The constitution was approved and black men were elected to dozens of positions. Before the Civil War, few Northern states allowed blacks to vote. Historian Eric Funner has found that only two black men held any public office in the United States before the Civil War. Macon B. Allen, America's probably second black lawyer and first black judge, served as the Justice of the Peace in Maine. Allen would, in fact, move to South Carolina after the war and practice law and serve as a judge. Funner also estimates that there were 2,000 Blacks who held public office in the South during Reconstruction. He's documented the careers of 315 in South Carolina, more than any other state. He found that 88 of these men had been born free, 131 had been born slave. So he presumed that most of them had been born into slavery. The election of 1868, in the election of 1868, a white Republican was elected governor, Robert K. Scott, who had been head of the Freedmen's Bureau. And white Republicans won all of their statewide offices except Secretary of State. Francis L. Cardozo, who I mentioned earlier, was elected Secretary of State, becoming the first African-American elected to any statewide office in the nation's history. Admittedly, someone was elected to a similar office in Louisiana the next day. Republicans won a majority in, in the House and Senate in the House, 109 of 124 members were Republicans, 75 were Black. In the Senate, 25 of 32 were Republicans and 10 were Black. During Reconstruction, let the legislature was led by Black men. Alonzo Ranzier and R.H. Fleas served as Lieutenant Governor and presided over the Senate. Samuel J. Lee from Aiken served six years as Speaker of the House. Stephen Swales from Williamsburg County served as President Pro Tem for six years. Robert Brown Elliott served as Speaker of the House for two years. Service in the legislature was not without peril. During the campaign of 1868, at least four black politicians were murdered, including two members of the legislature. They were James Martin of Abbeville and Senator Benjamin Randolph from Orangeburg. In the, in the legislature, a resolution memorializing their lives was introduced. Rising to speak on its behalf was William J. Whipper, who said, who made his mark as a radical that day, really. He rose, let's go down. Um, I do not charge any particular individual with complicity in these crimes as I know not the foul hands which perpetuated them but I do arraign the Democratic Party of South Carolina and charge it with responsibility of these heinous outrages. Whipper then pointed at the white Democrats and said, you are the cause. A legislative committee investigated these murders and as a result, the state created a militia to try to protect against KK Kant, Ku Klux Klan violence in the state. Whites, of course, were not without their friends in Washington, Andrew Johnson, issued an amnesty proclamation in December 25th of 1868 before he left office, which restored all civil rights to the vast majority of the men who had fought for the Confederacy. Encouraged by these, these expanded rights, many of them tried to interfere in the electoral process, but soon they realized fair elections would not work, especially in a place like South Carolina, and more aggressive tactics had to be employed. Many white planters threatened and intimidated black laborers in their employ. And soon the Klan was roaming across the state, injuring, killing, and threatening black voters. In reaction, Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act, which prohibited disguised groups from, par from parading in the streets and from trying to conspire to prevent people from holding office and voting. President Ulysses S. Grant, who was inaugurated in March of 1869, wanted to end Klan violence. In 1871, having grown totally frustrated, he suspended habeas corpus in nine South Carolina counties. It's the only place it happened in the, in the South and in the nation. And over 200 Klansmen were arrested in South Carolina. Former Confederate General Wade Hampton recruited Roberti Johnson of Maryland and Henry Stanberry of Ohio both former United States Attorney Generals who come to Columbia and defend the five Klansmen who were going to be put on trial. They lost, all five were convicted, 
And despite those efforts, 89 other men pled guilty. The Klan was broken up in the state. Despite the violence and the depressed economic conditions and the divisions within the Republican Party, the Black legislators tried to transform the state. And in the first legislative session, they enacted the state's first Civil Rights Act and made it unlawful for common carriers or businesses licensed by the state to discriminate based on race or color. It specifically prohibited passenger trains, streetcars, and theaters from discrimination on the basis of race. Interestingly, this provoked a boycott of the streetcars by whites in Charleston. Of course, the boycott didn't last that long because it was summer and Charles, white Charlestonians were not used to having to walk in hot human Charleston. The legislature, concerned with education, insisted that the state schools be done discriminatory in their admission policies and mandated two years of attendance for all children. By 1875, half of all children in the state, black or white, attended a public school. Other legislation covered welfare, mental health, civil legal systems, the prison reform, establishment of land commission. However, the land commission got off to a rocky, rocky start. One horrible example was the governor, Robert Scott, sold the commission some land for $100,000. This was swamp land, so it couldn't be farmed or homesteaded. He in turn took his $100,000 and invested it in land in, in his home state of Ohio, where he returned after he Except left the governor's mansion. Francis L. Cardozo was elected state treasurer in 1872 and as such took charge of the land commission and helped clean it up and corrected most of its problems in the few years he had to work with it. And there were thousands of families that did get land. With the legislature dominated by one party and neophytes, there was a lack of accountability at times and the legislature was plagued by actual corruption. States dort, the state's debt soared, and there was plenty of money floating around in Columbia and on, uh, in stock issues, et cetera. Corrupt Republicans, Democrats, black and white, stole millions of dollars. At least two former Confederate generals, Martin Gary and Matthew Butler, profited handsomely after one of these railroad deals. The most infamous Republican was Senator Honest John Patterson a wealthy white man from Pennsylvania who sought a United States Senate seat. His opponent was Robert Brown Elliott, to whom Patterson offered $15,000 to withdraw. Elliott refused. Honest John won anyway by paying $45,000 in bribes. Ultimately, he was indicted, but he escaped to the North. Not only was the political landscape transformed, the new state's court system established by the Constitution of, of 1868 uh, made it possible for black clients, black jurors, black lawyers, and even black judges to play significant roles in the administration of justice. Jonathan Jasper Wright was elected to the state Supreme Court in 1870 and served to 1877. He was the first black appellate judge in American history. Wright sat on more than 400 cases while on the bench. Two black lawyers, Macon B. Allen, who I mentioned earlier, and George Lee served as judges of the criminal court in Charleston. At least eight black mad, uh, probate judges were elected across the state and many more black judges served on the magistrate's court. But other than Wright's election, no other black had been elected to a statewide judgeship until December of 1875, when the legislature elected William Whipper to be a circuit court judge. But his election was opposed by whites and leading the charge was Governor D.H. Chamberlain, who had the power to deny Whipper the commission needed to serve as a judge. He denied it, claiming Whipper was corrupt. Chamberlain was in fact running for re-election and trying to appeal to the white voters. Whipper no doubt was a flamboyant figure. He was known as a gambler, but I haven't found any real evidence that he was corrupt. Whipper was ahead of his time in his attitude. He was a victim of Chamberlain's race class and ambition. Ironically, at the end of Reconstruction, D.H. Chamberlain left the state and Whipper re remained and finally achieved his ambition of becoming a judge by being elected probate judge in Beaufort in 1882. During Reconstruction, South Carolina sent six black men to Congress, 
Uh, J.H. Rainey was the first African-American to ever serve in the United States Congress. Also, Robert Brown Elliott, Robert DeLarge, R.H. Kane, Alonzo Ranzier, and Robert Schmalz served in Congress. 29-year-old Robert Brown Elliott became a strong voice for civil rights and certainly was the one who stood out in Congress. His greatest triumph came in one of those moments in American history that's remarkable for both its drama and irony. On January 5th, 1874, Georgia Congressman Alexander Stevens, former vice president of the Confederacy, was granted an hour to speak against the Civil Rights Bill. Elliot, over opposition by the Democrats, was granted an hour to respond. Elliot's biographer, Pe Peggy Lampson, described his speech as an overwhelming success by the national press. The bill would eventually become law. Civil Rights Act of 1875. Sadly, the statute's prohibition on the discrimination in public accommodations was declared unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court in 1883. Another Civil Rights Act was not passed by the United States Congress till 1957. And it was 1964 before Congress again outlawed discrimination in public accommodations. Outside the legislature, Legislators, black lawyers, and black leaders, black lawyers, teachers played important roles in trying to build a more just state. At least 49 black men were admitted to the state's bar. But outside the courts, these lawyers educated people by speaking at public events or at the Union League meetings, et cetera. In 1873, the University of South Carolina was desegregated. Richard T. Greener was hired as its first black member, first faculty member. To accommodate as many students as possible, the university opened a preparatory school and a normal school to educate teachers. It operated a medical, it operated a medical school, a law school, and offered degrees in philosophy, literature, arts, and sciences. In October of, of 1873, the school admitted Walter Raleigh Jones to its law school. He was among 19 students who would who had study in the school over the next three years. Not only had the university become the first institution of higher education in the South to admit African-American students, but the law school was the nation's first publicly supported law school to have black students. In its short history, the desegregated university had some impressive graduates. Among of them were two congressmen, Thomas Miller and George Washington Murray. There were prominent educators, college presidents, law school deans, ministers, and Tom and William Albert Sinclair was a physician and university educator who wrote The Aftermath of Slavery, one of the first works on Reconstruction and the first from the point of view of an African-American who lived in the period. The mere presence of African-American students on campus outraged many conservatives. The Charleston News and Curry pronounced the university is dead. Two years later, the Charleston paper asserted the South Carolina University has been broken up by the admission of colored students and has only a nominal existence. The fact was, however, that before the desegregation, the university had only 65 students. By 1876, as, as Reconstruction came to an end, the school had grown to 196 students and there were black and white students. White resistance to Reconstruction increased over time. In his election of 1874 neared whites in Edgefield, Barnwell, and Aiken counties organized saber and rifle clubs to threaten black voters. But the state militia of Edgefield was supplied with arms by Governor Chamberlain, and a standoff was in place by election day. And elections were held without any significant violence, and Republicans remained in control. But in 1875, Reconstruction had been overthrown in Mississippi by a campaign of violence. This inspired some radical ex-Confederates in South Carolina like Martin Gary to try to model a plan to seize power. In July, when a former Confederate General Matthew Butler led a mob of whites to demand the disarming of black militia in the black community of Hamburg, violence of course erupted. Struggle ensued, the militia retreated to their armory and Butler sent for reinforcements and a cannon. After dark, the militia was bombarded by the cannon Hamburg's black marshal was killed and 25 militia ushered out and supposedly arrested. Then the whites claimed they were gonna take the leaders in, into custody, but they marched them down the road and murdered them all. 
Witnesses claimed that Butler ordered the murders, but the murders, are, but after the murder, the towns were ransacked by the whites. Ben Tillman, later governor of South Carolina, bragged, bragged of his role in this incident. In 1877, Butler, who had clearly been in charge of it, was rewarded by the South Carolina legislature by being elected to the United States Senate. The Hamburg was just the beginning. The Hamburg massacre was just the beginning. There were more confrontations. In September, in Ellington and Aiken County, there were false rumors that an elderly white woman had been a assaulted by a black man and whites marauded and may have killed as many as a hundred black men, including state, Senate, state representative Simon Coker as he kneeled and prayed for mercy. As the campaign for 1876 produced, it produced General Wade Hampton as the candidate of the Democrats. He claimed to be a moderate, but his campaign was supported by Martin Gary's Edgefield plan, which was based on violence and fraud and even murder. His, my, Gary's plan of campaign or Edgefield plan called upon every Democrat to control the vote of at least one Negro by intimidation, purchase, keeping him away, or as each individual may determine, always bearing in mind that argument has no effect on them, they can only be influenced by their fears. Organized rifle clubs dressed in red, came known as the Red Shirts rode on horses and mules in large companies to harass and disrupt Republican rallies and terrorize as many Blacks as possible. When Red Shirts would arrive at, at campaign rallies, they would demand equal time and force the, the Republicans off the stage. A reign of terror swept through Edgefield, Aiken, and Barnwell counties. By all accounts, most of the election of 1876 was calm and was close, but the red shirts tactics played a decisive role in stealing the election and ending reconstruction. An election day in Edgefield, intimidation and threats were the order of the day. Two black legislators, Lawrence Kane and Paris Simpkins, were seeking re-election to the legislature. However, like many black voters in Edgefield, Kane and Simpkins faced threats and actual physical violence. So valuing their lives more than re-election, they did not vote. Not satisfied with the use of violence to prevent black voting, the white Democrats stuffed Edgefield ballot boxes with the ballots of white voters from Georgia. Once election results came in, Wade Hampton and D.H. Chamberlain claimed victory. State Election Commission declared Chamberlain the victor by over a thousand votes. It's the highest vote total any Kubrick candidate had ever received, but until the Democrats claimed they had the votes of Hampton of 92,216 to 91,127. That vote margin came all from Edgefield County, which had 2,000 more votes than it had registered voters. On the national level, as the Republican Party had grown more conservative as such radicals as Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens had died, the party became more interested in the interests of corporations such as railroads and the interests of people, working people, white and black, was pushed aside. President Grant's administration had been plagued by allegations of fraud, the depression of 1873, racial violence in Mississippi and Louisiana, and then of course, South Carolina. So the stage was set for the compromise of 1877, which settled the hayes tilden presidential election. The Rutherford Republican Rutherford B. Hayes was awarded the electoral votes of South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida in exchange for a withdrawal of all the federal troops from the Southern states. When federal troops were withdrawn in April of 1877, D.H. Chamberlain gave up the governorship and left the state. Black officials knew that what protection they had had was gone. Soon, Democrats seized both branches of government, both houses of government and the executive branch. The white Democratic House began expelling members. For example, Black lawyer D.A. Straker was expelled for gross contempt and defiant attitude. I think that was his skin color is what those words meant. And that by 1877, only 27 African-Americans remained in the legislature. 
In June 1877, in one of its first acts, the new majority white legislature closed the University of South Carolina. The critics of the radical university had been right in predicting its destruction. That destruction, however, came at the hands of the white conservative South Carolinians who used violence and fraud to overthrow the Republicans, who then closed the university to prevent African-Americans from being educated at the school. But before we leave Reconstruction, I'll leave you with, with the words of a few wise men. Um, land reform did not really come. It's, it's estimated that maybe as, eight, as many as 18,000 families out of 100,000 families got land. Um, w. Du Bois said this about Reconstruction. The slave went free stood a moment, brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. Eric Foner, America's preeminent historian on the subject of Reconstruction, says, Reconstruction failed. And for its black, for blacks, its failure was a disaster whose magnitude cannot be obscured by the genuine accomplishments that did endure. This lesson wise man though would say to you, but it is in many ways remarkable that it happened at all. Thank you, Dean Burke. I do want to point out that Eric Foner, the man you just, you just complimented as the Dean of Reconstruction wrote the introduction to your book, The Founding Fathers. Um, I, I, Robert, you ready to take some questions with uh, Dean Burke and to moderate those questions in chat? Y'all put your questions in chat. Uh, yeah, sure thing. And first, uh, Dean Burke, great presentation. Thank you so much for that. I, I really captured the essence of Reconstruction in South Carolina and why the state was so important in the Reconstruction era. So thank you so much for that. Um, so please, if you have any questions about tonight's uh, lectures from either myself or Dean Burke, please put those questions in the Q&A and we can go ahead and get started answering those questions as soon as possible. And by the way, I, I do want to also point out too that I'm, I'm glad Dean Burke mentioned uh, the Land Commission. Uh, I actually had the privilege of working about three or four years ago with Congaree National Park uh, and they're doing a historic resource survey and they're really in the near future hoping to say more about the land commission's role in Lower Richland in particular, because there are some families there, Lower Richland, that still own land their ancestors purchased via the land commission in the 1870s. That's great to hear. The promised land up in Abbeville and Greenwood County has uh, still got some families too that trace their, their farms back to, to the land commission. Well, while we're waiting for those questions to roll in, if either one of you want to address the uh, the, the um, uh, martial law that was implemented in the upstate counties, which counties were those? And there were trials. I think there was. Oh, uh, give me a second. I'll get, I'll read you off the list of counties. Spartanburg Union, and there's something about the upstate that is deeply embedded in their DNA that they need to know. Okay. So this question's coming in now, um, Robert, if you want to read them out, Mary Lewis can answer them and deal with mine later. Oh, sure thing. So uh, there is a question here. We have a few that are coming in right now. Um, so one is, uh, Dean Burke, did I understand you say that half of the state's children attended a public school in 1875? That's what, that's what I've read, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty phenomenal number. It, considering we didn't have any public education at all before <laughs> that. Okay, and then there's a question, what was the promised land in Abbeville or Greenwood County? I haven't heard of that. That's, that's their families that, that, that the area is called promised land and their families there that, uh, that got their land through the, through the commission, land commission. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is, um, 
it, what's what's interesting about and actually there is a book it, it's kind of hard to find now um but it's it's called promised land a century of life a negro community i'll put it in the chat as well um that's actually about that part of of south carolina but one of the things that that dean brooks getting at here that's really important to also mention is that there are and what you see tonight is that there are enclaves of, of black life in south carolina whether it's port royal lower richland Greenwood area, places that were experiments in Black self-sufficiency as much as was possible in this time period, which again was in and to itself a tremendous story to think of. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, please speak more in the Civil War battles fought in South Carolina. Well, uh, the big thing about the battles in South Carolina You have to keep in mind that most of the big battles of the war are being fought further away. They're being fought in Virginia, especially with the Army of Northern Virginia being such a target unto itself, or they're being fought in Tennessee um, as the Union is trying to make its, its way deeper into the Deep South. Uh, but with the Civil War battles in South Carolina, you really have what you could call three phases. Phase one is the Port Royal battles in 1861, which are, are very short. Uh, in, in length. Phase two in 1863, there is an attempt by the federal government to really make a push towards Charleston. And this actually is what leads to the Battle of Fort Wagner in July of 1863, where the famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment uh, fights in the storming of Battery Wagner. Again, if you've seen the film Glory, you've seen the dramatization of that battle. Uh, unfortunately, the 54th and other supporting units are repulsed and Battery Wagner remains in Confederate hands. But then in 1864 and 65, that's when you really get most of the major battles in South Carolina being fought during the Civil War, where the Federal Army under William T. Sherman enters the state uh, with the express goal of essentially taking Columbia and bringing into the war in South Carolina. And many of the battles fought in 1865 are essentially, from South Carolina's perspective, desperate rearguard actions or trying to hold off the Federal Army as long as they possibly can. But as I mentioned before, uh, by this point, the Confederate Army is in tatters. Most of the best South Carolina units are actually fighting in Northern Virginia. And what they have in South Carolina is just old men and young boys, depending on the state. I don't wanna go too far with this parallel, but it's actually a reminder, reminiscent rather, of what you'll see at the end of World War II in Germany, when the German government is basically throwing everything they have at the war effort, which includes, again, young boys and old men who aren't really battle ready or really trained to fight uh, in a war. This is the same going on in South Carolina in 1865. Uh, one more thing about the battles, though, is that it also exposes just how much the state's infrastructure has fallen apart, because you see more and more enslaved Africans using the battles as an opportunity to escape to freedom, uh, going really in three directions. Uh, some of them are going north towards East Tennessee, where the Union has already had a, a considerable presence during the war. Some are going west towards Georgia, after it falls to General Sherman. And then lastly, some enslaved Africans are fleeing to Charleston in the Low Country area, where near Port Royal, of course, the Federal Army has a presence as well. Okay. Um, okay, another question. Uh, at the time, were there any movements for reparations for Black people connected to land reform or similar efforts? Well, the Land Commission was that. Mm -hmm. And it was not 40 acres and a mule, but um, the land was sold at, uh, at very low prices, as I, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly right. Um, you do see attempts to, I mean, the Land Commission is, is created essentially to be a response to that question about reparations. Um, you do see other attempts across the South by some formerly enslaved people to sue for reparations that it don't get terribly far. Um, but the recognition here is that the fact that the Land Commission is the only attempt by a Southern state during the Reconstruction era to redistribute land to, to African Americans is still noteworthy. The fact it didn't happen anywhere else, I think, shows how South Carolina's experience was, was relatively unique during the Reconstruction era. Um, but with your question about reparations really quickly, it's also worth noting that a lot of reparations arguments today um, whether you read ta Cook's essay from uh, 2014 or you go back to reparations debates in the 60s and 70s, 
many of them actually begin not so much with slavery as do with reconstruction and the failure to help four million newly freed black men, women, and children get on their feet in the aftermath of civil war and slavery. Okay, other question. Uh, pre Vesey, uh, do we have information as to the black church position on revolts rebellion? That's an interesting question. Um, now, what's interesting is that the AME church by 1822 was still a relatively young institution. Um, it had only really started in the 1790s uh, under uh, Bishop Richard Allen in Philadelphia. But the church itself, I'll put it this way, it really depends on what part of the country you're in. Certainly, what will become Emmanuel AME Church will provide some support for a slave rebellion in South Carolina. But more importantly, the Black church in the early 19th century is the only place that's actually using the Bible as a justification for resistance to slavery. As many of you probably already know, uh, most white Christians in the South, they are, when they expose their enslaved Africans to Christianity, they're doing so via passages that are, you know, construed in a way to be pro-slavery. But the black church is one of the few places saying, well, actually look at other parts of the Bible. There are places that also provide justification for rising up in rebellion, rising up for freedom. And of course, certainly Nat Turner is another good example of, of what that would ultimately look like. Okay. Um, let's see, another question here. Got a lot of comments rolling in now. Um, in last week's session, we started to talk about the issues faced by Native Americans. How did land reform affect Native Americans? Well, I, I would say by this point, the, the indigenous presence in South Carolina is very small by the reconstruction period. But if you're talking about land reform on a national level, then certainly the Homestead Act of 1862 is going to have a significant impact on westward expansion in the 1860s and 1870s and beyond. As the federal government is promising cheap land to, to white settlers to move out west. Um, and so certainly if you think about land reform on a federal level, it benefits primarily white um, settlers across the country to the detriment of A, indigenous folks in the West, and be the fact that Homestead Act, for instance, didn't really offer as much aid to African Americans, is something that in the 20th century, many activists like Martin Luther King Jr., for instance, would also uh, point out too. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, okay, so here's another question here. Who were the enslaved Africans? Why were they the African enslaved in South Carolina? Who were the Europeans? Why were they in South Carolina? Um, okay, so, you know, last week's class um, actually um, answers those questions, if you go back to the recording, but to give you a very, very brief answer there. Um, what's interesting about the enslavement of Africans in the Americas is that I think many of us have this view of enslavement as they're just getting Africans from Africa and that's it. In fact, what's happening is that they are often looking for Africans from certain parts of West and Southwest Africa to live in different parts of the Americas based on their knowledge of the land, based on knowledge of agriculture, of engineering, et cetera. For example, in South Carolina, uh, in the 18th century especially, most of the enslaved Africans who were brought to South Carolina were brought from, from the Congo Kingdom on the coast of Southwest Africa, mainly because of their expertise in growing, for example, rice. Uh, the Europeans, of course, by the 18th and 19th centuries, were the descendants of A, the Barbadians, the English settlers of Barbados moved to South Carolina in the 1660s, and then B, of course, white immigrants from uh, Britain, Scotland, uh, and to a lesser extent, France as well. Um, and they were in South Carolina primarily to make money off the land, the enslavement of Africans and indigenous folks too. And again, if you want a more detailed version of the answer, uh, that was basically uh, most of class one from last week, which is the recording of that is online uh, right now. Okay, uh, what could Republicans in the federal government or even those in the state government in South Carolina have done to ensure that the efforts of reconstruction persisted? Shouldn't the federal government have put their foot down when they saw what white supremacists in the South were up to? Yes, they should have, but they didn't. <laughs> And that's that was the failure of um, 
the Republican Party. They were more interested in railroads and banks than they were uh, in uh, black people in the South or working people in general. Mm -hmm. yeah, indeed, and, and to your point also with Carolyn's question as well, uh, one of the readings for tonight, uh, the Douglas option, uh, actually gets into the idea of how Frederick Douglass in the 1860s is telling President Andrew Johnson and other and Republicans in general, your best chance to create a lasting reconstruction policy is to build a Republican party that is a biracial coalition of African-Americans and poor whites across the South. And as you've seen this evening, um, as Dean Burke is so, has so magnificently shown us, in South Carolina, black Republicans are certainly interested in that, but they're, they're clearly not getting enough support from the federal government, from the National Republican Party to do so in the long term. As Steen Burke just said, by the 1870s, Republicans are way more interested in economic growth, building railroads, et cetera. And especially after 1873, when that year's panic causes a national depression, Republicans are basically saying, you know what? Civil rights is, is good, it's a, it's a nice idea, but we're far more concerned with how we can hold on to power nationally, no matter the cost. And that includes sacrificing African American in South Carolina, then so be it. Uh, one more thing, though, I, I will point out that to an extent, with the declaration of martial law in the upstate, uh, with the suspension of habeas corpus, uh, President Grant does to an extent put his foot down, uh, but it, it's not nearly enough. Uh, and there's also, uh, I recommend another another book very quickly. Uh, it's titled After Appomattox. Um, and I'm going to misspell Appomattox because it's the word Appomattox, so I'm sorry. But <laughs> um, um, but it's a book by Greg Downs. And his argument is a very simple one, that one of the reasons Reconstruction doesn't quite work in the South is that quite simply, the federal government does not have enough troops in the 1860s and 1870s to enforce Reconstruction. At the height of the Civil War in 1865, the, the federal government's military force is about a million men in under arms. By 1866 or so, it's down to, I think, maybe 100,000, probably less than that. And keep in mind, most of those troops who are left behind are actually being sent out west to fight in the Indian Wars. And so there aren't enough troops in the South to really enforce Reconstruction, and that becomes a major, major issue. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me interject something there, Robert. That uh, suspension of, of habeas corpus was 1871. So it's before the financial fall. Oh, yeah, so, uh, and answer Brett's question about what counties it was. It was Newberry, Spartanburg, Union, uh, Chester, Lawrence, York, and Fairfield, and Lancaster, and Chesterfield. My goodness, it was, it was a lot of counties. <laughs> Oh, definitely. All right, next question. How did the Port Royal experiment play out? Was the community eventually left alone? Were white Northerners angered by former slaves reluctant to accept their help? So uh, the Port Royal experiment, it, it's seen as a qualified success in the sense that it does give ammunition to radical Republicans in Congress to argue that if we're not going to give the enslaved land, uh, as Thaddeus Stevens actually wanted to do, at the very least, we should grant them some modicum of civil rights to give them the ability to build themselves up economically. Um, ultimately, the Port Royal experiment in the long run, that those communities like Mitchellville, for example, other parts of, of Buford and Low Country, they're going to become bedrocks of Black political power in the 1870s, 1880s, even in, to an extent, the early 1890s. Uh, so in some sense, the Port Royal experiment does lead to some black self-sufficiency, but by 1900, of course, the entire state, as you'll see in our next class session, is going to be under white supremacist rule. As for white northerners being angered by um, the former slave plantings to accept their help, well, sure. I mean, there was some surprise and anger and hurt that the enslaved, the, the formerly enslaved peoples were not just accepting what the white northerners were giving them at face value. Uh, but, you know, some of the white abolitionists also understood why they were angry and upset. They said, we have to understand where they are coming from. Okay. Okay, that's a great comment in the chat. It's amazing our state history has such a period of equality. It's equally amazing that white supremacy is as pervasive as it is today. My fervent hope is that we all take these lessons and turn this amazement into commitment 
we will do our best to return to and better where we were during reconstruction. And I couldn't agree with you more on that. Okay. Do you think slavery could have survived without the Civil War? That's an interesting question. So Dean Burke, do you want to take that one on first? I fear it would have, it would have survived a, a, a lot longer. Hmm. I mean, obviously it would not have ended uh, as abruptly as it did. Let me let me butt in here, Robert, that, that what we're going to experience going through the rest of the eras here is the ability of what we would consider the lost cause to be able to change their message to end up that now we have the white supremacist party being the Republicans. We, we have a white Republican Party in this country, and they are running the line that the white Democrats used to run. But the message is more from slavery to servitude to um, limited equal separate but equal to now we're talking about trying to figure out how to work it out but we'll go through those periods as we move through the eras and touch on the things the the politicians in south carolina that actually had their finger on that scale on a national and even international level from the time of, of uh, john c calhoun right on up to the time of the southern strategy that's in place now <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, that's a very good point there. And, and I will also add to the question about slavery survived by the Civil War. Keep in mind that even after the Confederacy collapsed in 1865, you still have slavery in places like uh, Cuba, um, Brazil. Brazil has it until 1888. And it is worth also noting that slavery itself in the American South, even though we often associate it with the growth of cotton for obvious reasons, it could also be changed to do other things. Um, and so I certainly do not want to imagine a world where slavery exists in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and so forth. If that were to have happened, of course, that would have also meant a drastically different American history because it either assumes that A, the Confederacy wins the Civil War, or B, there's no Civil War at all, which probably assumes Abraham Lincoln's not president in 1860. Um, but yeah, I think it could have survived without the Civil War. And the thing about slavery is that it, it could find ways to, to change form. Uh, keep in mind, and I don't wanna make a direct comparison here, but during World War II, uh, Nazi Germany used slave labor to, to fight the war, importing billions of Europeans from across the continent of Europe into Germany itself to do massive amounts of slave labor. So it's certainly possible. Okay. Well, and across the South with peonage and sharecropping, um, it was certainly a form of, of slavery that ex that had, that existed even into the 1940s in Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, et cetera. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Let's see. Robert, it was in nineteen in the 1960s, living in Beaufort, in segregated Beaufort, that I was at the uh, Sheriff McTeer's property because I was a friend of his grandson. When I heard the sheriff tell one of the deputies, go get me 12 bucks for the weekend. And he wasn't talking about deer. He wasn't talking about money. He was talking about black men to work on the farm. Yeah. That was in the 60s. So exactly. we, we, we have not fallen far from that tree of forbidden fruit. No. Yeah. All right, another good question in the chat here. There's a lot of good questions and comments this evening. I'm really enjoying this. Fundamentally, the U.S. government is aligned with and supportive of white supremacy. So why would the government have ever countermanded them? That's a rather interesting question to think about. I, I, think, I think part of what we have to remember about the Reconstruction period, though, is that there was a brief moment, as, as Dean Burke alluded to this, this evening, of white northerners wanting to essentially finish the job especially once you see the black codes in place in 1865 and you see ex-confederates coming returning to congress there are many who are, are saying well it's clear that the civil war and our victory in the war wasn't quite enough that we're going to have to go a step further with pushing the reconstruction act the civil rights act the, the reconstruction amendments and, and so forth and so while i think you know you're right in some sense about white supremacy being something the US government's aligned to, this was one of those moments where it looked like for a few years at least, where people were willing to question the very assumptions of white supremacy 
as we knew them in the 1860s and 1870s. Certainly it wasn't quite enough, but there was that continued questioning, questioning of this idea of white supremacy. Okay. Another question, while there was a Port Royal experiment, the vast majority of Africans were left abandoned by the slave masters who evacuated the plantations. Are there any other documented accounts of that history? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you know, the Port Royal experiment is one of those things that there have been uh, a few books and articles written about it. It does get considerable mention in many reconstruction histories, um, especially by folks like the Boys' Black Reconstruction America gets to the Port Royal experiment, for example. Um, I'll try to dig up a few more uh, book titles for you and try to send those out to the class sometime later this week, because that's certainly an important part of this history. And of course, on the Majeska Simpkins uh, School website, there we have some readings up there about the Port Royal Experiment as well. Okay. Okay, well, there's an interesting question here. During Reconstruction, would it have been more beneficial for activists and Blacks to remain in the South and persist rather than migrating West or North? Thinking about Ida B. Wells leaving Tennessee and encouraging folks to go with her and the group he says was saying thing in South Carolina, do you think this would have impacted today's political climate if things would have been different? Well, actually the vast majority of African-Americans do stay in the South during and after reconstruction. You do have attempts, I'll put this in the chat really quickly, you do have African-Americans who urge immigration. Uh, some uh, actually, like for example, Henry McNeil Turner, I'll put his name in the chat real quick. Um, he pushes for immigration to Africa in the 1860s and 1870s. He gets a few adherents to that. You have the exo-duster movement um, in the 1870s and 1880s, pushing African-Americans to move to places like Kansas and Oklahoma. But for the most part, the vast majority of African-Americans they do stay in the South, and they, they do persist in the South. But let's remember to look at this from their perspective for a second. We will be asking them to stay in a part of the country where hundreds, if not thousands of African-Americans were tortured, brutalized, and murdered during the Reconstruction period. Um, they did remain in the South. They did persist, even during the 20th century with the great migration of Blacks from the South and the North and the West. Even though you have millions of African-Americans leaving to go north and west, the majority of African-Americans remain in the South. Um, and those African-Americans become the backbone of the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Um, now, I think to answer your question, I'll reverse it, actually. And when we get to talking about the 20th century in South Carolina and American history, one of the things you'll see is that the presence of African-Americans in the north and the west actually has a significant impact on how civil rights is seen nationally in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s and such. But we'll, we'll get to that later on um, in the Justice School class. Okay. Okay. Okay, some good stuff, some good. Yeah, Bishop King had an exodus movement as well. Any final questions? We've got about three minutes left this evening. So what, what we want to talk about now, Danny, you still got the screen, is um, <laughs> the, the sense that I have that the white working people in South Carolina feel they tremendously lost something and that the reconstruction, Louisa McCord, who we didn't touch on enough tonight, who was the, the um, avatar of, of socialism being the evil in the 1840s. I had no idea there was an anti-socialist movement in America in the 1840s and that Louisa McCord lived on the corner of Bull and uh, Pendleton, right across from the horseshoe at the university, and that the little horseshoe where the administration building is. And, and she became, um, very unusually, a woman writer who was, uh, was uh, arguing against the type of socialist influence that was creeping in from Europe. But she said that Reconstruction was worse than the war and that, that the dissolution, the destruction and everything was something that, that made a lot of people that hadn't really had a dog in the fight feel the pain of it. And so one of the things that I think that we need to anticipate, uh, understand is that these, these people are angry and they don't know who to be angry at. 
And so their anger is directed at the same people that are played off against them. I mean, I, I recall living in, in, in Olympia in, in the 70s when we were doing the grassroots organizing workshop when the fellow that lived next door to us had worked in the mill for 50 years. And we were there in the 70s. So he started working in the mill in the 20s. And the, the mill was segregated. But he didn't, he got to come in the front door. And so the little bit of privilege that had been doled out to the white working class still is a game they play. And, you know, it's a game of fools. And we have to understand how to be able to relate to people about how they're being taken advantage of. And I think that the Trump administration and the, the COVID thing is waking people up at least to some of the, the, the liability of having everything in your country being for profit. That's health care or education. And so we want to open the, the floor here to, to people raising their hands. Daniel, we need to uh, stop the screen share. It's off on my screen, Brett. Okay, we go to gallery. There we go. That's, yeah, well, everybody, if you set your screen like I just did, at gallery, I see all the lovely faces here. We've got uh, 40 people on the thing. And if you want to speak, you can see my hand raised now. See how my hand is raised? And what we'll do is Dr. Green will call your name and you'll be able to ask a question or make a comment. And either, either of our brilliant academicians or your left-wing lunatic here will respond appropriately. Go for it, guys. Raise your hand. There's Marjorie is raising her real hand. <laughs> Call on that woman. Please. All right, Marjorie, go right ahead. <laughs> and she's got to unmute herself. It's the only way we can keep her quiet. No, we, we, we can't hear you, Marjorie. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, I guess a number of things. Um, there, there's some reference in there to Ida B. Wells oh. and, um, and, and her. Um, she had no choice about leaving Memphis, by the way. Um, two of her very close friends were lynched and she had to get out of town, as I recall. But more, and, and, but, but the, there is something annoying about that last piece that, that was played. Um, I just couldn't develop very much sympathy, if any, number one. Um, but the other thing is that, again, um, the singer's perspective on, you know, my daddy farmed and I'm gonna go farm too. And, and we never had that luxury um, for our generation or those that followed us. So again, I found it very annoying. Let me put it that way. You can move Lord, me. I knew that would be provocative and I didn't do it for sympathy. I did it for understanding. Okay. Because I want to know my enemy. I mean, I have been beaten in police custody for being what they call while they were beating me a nigger lover. And that goes back 40 years. And so I got some insight into these people. I want to win. So I need to understand the people I'm dealing with, the people I'm fighting, frankly. And okay. so I'm glad you were provoked because it was supposed to be provoked. Well, one more thing then I add to that is I was the only black child in a school from grades one through eight. I know my white people. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. And I want you all to know that Marjorie is my boss and she can fire me in a heartbeat. So I'm taking a chance here. Thank you, ma'am. But I, I want to recognize Seth Whipper and give him a chance before he goes away to say something. Seth, you still with us? I'm, I'm here. I I'll tell you, it's just, oh, yeah. goodness. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. Glad to see all the people with the hearts in the right place. Um, now there is a future to the South that's better than its past. You all just have to have the courage to, to move in the right direction. And, and so it means that, Brett, um, I can't let I can't let rednecks beat you from around. I can't let blacks beat you from around. Because there's a difference between right and wrong that we all have to be willing to stand against, for, I mean, stand for the right. And so that means that <clears throat> for you, my brother, who's done so much and has put so much on the line, I appreciate that as much.
much as I appreciate what <clears throat> Matthew Perry has done. Mm. We, we have to recognize that that is the future. Mm. This is the right balance. So how we get there, I know it starts with uh, the education that's occurring oh, at the, the Majeska School. Um, by the way, uh, I met her in 1970, in, in 1969, when I moved to Columbia after I returned from school. And so I opened my first savings account in South Carolina. I opened it at Victory Sears Bank. She was sitting behind the counter when I walked in. And uh, we always had a nice, warm relationship because I recognized who she was and what we were trying to do back then. But I'm glad to see that this is happening. Uh, if I can assist everyone in what they're doing. Um, William Whipper is my great, great uncle of some, what some count. Um, he is the brother of a fellow by the name of Samuel uh, Parker Whipper. There were a number of them who came down with him. And uh, some of them continued down into Florida, uh, but he decided to stay. And I might say that <clears throat> he left with Francis and they, uh, Francis started a school in Washington, D.C. for uh, uh, young mothers who had children out of wedlock. Um, uh, some elements of that school are still around today. And then he decided that what was going on and why, he had, why she wanted him to leave because she thought that, well, you know, these people are not going to change. Well, let's get the hell out of here. And he decided, well, look, I have a commission back there in Buford. I'm going back to get it. And so he and a few others uh, Dr. Burke attended that um, last Constitutional Convention, I think, where oh boy, I think it was Tillman, one of those who was um, a governor at the time, but they did make speeches against a lot of the black codes and things that were being um, attempted to uh, put in place. But yeah, we've got to be willing to accept everything about who we are. Um, I'm from South Carolina, just like you. And um, I know right from wrong. And so that's what I do. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you so much, Becky. Uh, all I know is <clears throat> somebody needs to wake up that point newspaper. Thank you, Seth. I, you shouldn't have mentioned that. Becky's been mad at me for 20 years now. We started a newspaper in 1990 that Becky took over when she brought an article in. The point of the newspaper was to organize a progressive state movement. And as that started happening in 96, the newspaper fell aside. And I've, I've never ended up paying for that. But thank you, Seth. And I promise you, we're going to organize something that you can be the last, you can be the magistrate with your last duties to let us go without bond. I don't see any hands up. Nobody. Oh, actually, I, I've seen a couple. Um, okay, Robert, take yes. over. Yes. So uh, I saw that uh, Gene Hammock's hand was up. So Gene go first, and then Miko Pickett's hand was up as well. So Thanks, Gene buddy. first, then Miko afterwards. And please, Gene, uh, unmute yourself as well, please. Oh, one more time. Hey, you're still muted right now. Mute. How's there that? We go. Yes. Okay. I don't know where to start. Uh, this has been, as a northerner, a complete northerner, born in Brooklyn, lived there all my life. Um, you don't, you know what's going on. You hear some things, you read some things, but it's very d different coming here and living it and seeing the places and meeting the people and the uh, progeny of those people. Uh, it's fascinating. But the one thing that I don't know which one of you said is we have to we have to have a connection with each other for good or for bad. We have to learn to speak to each other. We have to learn to understand what the other person is coming from. If it's a bad place, it's a bad place, but you got to understand it. Now, I got to say, I'm with my sister-in-law when it comes to that, that song, and I know you want us to understand it, but in my heart of hearts, what I'm saying is, I don't give a you-know-what about burning Dixie down when they're killing Black folks, and even today, they're talking about hanging people from the highest tree. So 
I understand that we have to understand, but we they have to understand us as well. Uh, we're not, so asking, we, we're yeah. not asking you to chill out, Jane. Um, I'm, 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 <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but um, we'll get there. I do believe we will get there. And one, like I always bring up every time I can, we got to get to the kids because that's where it starts. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that. That's greatly appreciated. I think you're right on the money there. Okay, Miko, please go ahead. Your hands been up for a while too. Sure. Um, so, all right. I don't know if I'm supposed to feel this way, but like Jean, I am a Jersey girl born and raised. And I have, uh, I moved to Charlotte about 14 years ago. I've been in South Carolina for four years and I've seen some things after before running for office with the with the disasters and then in running for office. And I, I literally have a headache right now. And I don't know whether I want to cry or just break some stuff. Because what I learned tonight, those tactics are being deployed against me today. Absolutely. I'm going to read y'all a text that I got today that somebody sent. Somebody sent this text to somebody else and they gave it to me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna replace the names to protect protect, not the innocent, but just to protect. The text starts off with a woman who's doing vote harvesting, right? So this is a woman who's vote harvesting in South Carolina in my county for money. And I know it, but we have a we, we're trying to stop them. They've been doing it for Dozens of years. So this is the text. Please support candidate X and candidate Y. Then the respond is okay. Then the text from this person is, you should have received the ballot by tomorrow. Will you please let me walk them in? I get paid for how many I show them I have. Oh. I have had, they call the police on me every weekend. I don't know, y'all. I just, okay, I'm gonna I'm take it down. But uh, I just wanted to make, you know, I just don't know. And, and, and Dr. Green, maybe you could tell me, like this, I'm feeling torn up inside. You know, like torn to pieces. And I don't know if I should be mad or if this just is this class. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, now you know something, Miko, that you didn't know before. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> Well, in a way, I would, um, I would actually hope you you would be mad. I mean, I, I, I think part of what makes the Majestic School such an interesting experience for me as a historian is to be able to hear stories like what you just told us and to remind all of us that the kinds of things we're talking about from the Reconstruction era are tactics well, yeah. that are being used today. Yeah. Uh, this is... The thing about history is that it's, it's not meant so much to just tell you what happened in the past. It's to, to gird you for what's, gonna, what's happening in the here and now and to prepare you for, for what might be coming down the pipeline as well. Um, so I, I, you, you should be angry, but I would only ask you, and I think you're already doing this right now, to use that anger to make the kind of change you want to see. And I think you're already doing that. But Every time I do Reconstruction or I do slavery in a class, I'm, I'm always, deep down, okay. I'm angry. Now, I did see Jackie had her hand up, too. Yes, I do. Yes, I How you do? You know, I wanted to make a comment in general um, about this. It's interesting. I have a different opinion. I am, I lived in New York City for 32 years, so I can appreciate how the Northerners feel in the sense of hearing this, but I've also lived here very much entrenched in the history. I live across the street from 
uh, land that was owned by Benjamin Mays and his family and that I purchased from him. He was a friend of my granddaddy who was a sharecropper and I attend a church that was built in 1865 and has been here since reconstruction. So that's my, grand, my grandmother's church. So I was also director of the South Carolina's governor's mansion in 1979, which flew the Confederate flag. And when the governor of Virginia and his wife had a meeting once, I remember it being commented on Facebook about uh, slavery and that being brought up on their tours during the governor's mansion, I thought, well, that was appropriate because I felt the same way when I was at the South Carolina's governor's mansion and I was the first black director there, may not have ever been another, but I was quite proud that hands that had picked the cotton and that been a part of this state as a slave, now I was the first person you saw before you met the governor when you came in the governor's mansion. And I felt like I was in a right place to describe or to even give context about what our country was about. I don't like people who dis regard the history of either side, black or white. I went to the University of South Carolina just because I could, so I could learn about the white folks, quite frankly. I said, oh, I need to get deeply entrenched in this. I want to know you so you can know me. And I think when we dismiss either side and become so sensitive that we can't hear it, that it erupts us emotionally, that we stop the conversation. That's probably the reason why you hear Biden uh, say, this is not who we are, when this is who we are. And I'm always wondering, has he not taken any history classes? Why not lead the country in a historical discussion about why, for example, Asians are historically thought of in this way in our country? We've dismissed them twice in this country. So just on that segment alone, or yet even talk about why Blacks feel the way they do in the midst of Black Lives Matter, et cetera. He is not giving the country a history lesson. The thing that has made me most mad about Nikki Haley is the fact that she came from a state that was established for slavery. And she got on that stage and said, America is not a racist country. I wanted to know where the hell she went to school. So that's my comment. Well, you hear that, Brett? We should try to get uh, Joe Biden to take the class next year. We can. <laughs> no, that's not funny. Actually, it should be something. Yeah. It should be something brought up to uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, and they can spread it around, maybe. But it should definitely be, how come our legislators and people seem unaware of our history and proud of it? Well, well I'll, Robert, I want to address Miko and Jackie and our visitors at, and Gene from from the northern lands that have come here to join us. That if you bear with us for another uh, twelve weeks, we're going to get past the history and learn how to apply it, and that we're going to do a strategy analysis and and practice lessons that all you have, and then we're going to have special tools and skill sessions. And so we're not just doing this as a history lesson. We're doing this because we are committed, I am, and you will be hopefully if you graduate honestly from this course, a committed revolutionary that Dr. King talked about, the revolution for social justice. And that, that's what Majesco was involved in. That's what I've been involved in since I isolated myself in polite society by being raised well. And this is what we're trying to lead you into doing. And so bear with us because they're, they're, as, as we go through the class, like for instance, the song that we played tonight, the night they drove old Dixie down, sets the stage for the next number of years. In 1995, they wrote a constitution with the express purpose of excluding black people that wasn't changed. It really hasn't been changed. It's still the constitution we're under. And there weren't any people of color that were in office until 1970. And I was involved in that. And there, Seth Whipper was around and doing that. And so this is not ancient history. I mean, we're ancient, and so our history is a little older. And part of what the school is about is, damn it, I hope that there's some people under, under 40. I'd love it if there are people under 30 on this thing tonight. But if we don't get the children, we're going to be doing this in another 30 years. <laughs>
Robert. Um, I, did, I, I did want to add something about why, and, and all, all kidding aside about why Joe Biden is not more outspoken about these issues and why most politicians are not. It, it's a couple of reasons. Number one, most, especially older politicians, when they were going to, to school, K through 12 and college, they were receiving a certain version of American history that saw American history as being just automatically progressive. Like things were always getting better. It ignored African-American history, indigenous history, the, the history of things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and so forth. So I think that's part of the problem. But even politicians who do know this history, say a Barack Obama, for instance, they will allude to the progress made in American history. They'll use moments to educate the American people. But I think whether it's a president or a, a senator or a governor, they may also be thinking of, well, what kind of political calculus do I have to make to use my platform to talk about history? Because you can, you can, as we've seen in the last few years, we can cite plenty of books and articles and actual primary sources, but then there'll always be people who are saying, oh, you're just trying to be anti-American, or you're just trying to denigrate the country by talking about the fact that the Confederate government actually fought against the U.S. government in the Civil War, uh, that kind of thing. And so we, part of the, the purpose of classes like this and other grassroots campaigns to really change history education in this country are attempts to get the American people to think more deeply and critically about the kinds of histories they've either already learned or will continue to learn. As a historian in both with a foot in the academic world and a foot in the scholar activist world, I see this all the time. Uh, it's a continuing battle on the internet, it's a continuing battle in print media, in television media, etc. And it's even a battle in, in the bookshelves that say a Barnes and Noble. When you go in there and you see a history book written by Bill O'Reilly, and it's like, well, I don't know about that. But then you look at the mainstream history texts and even those are leaving out, uh, so for example, women of color or leaving out the indigenous peoples, et cetera, and so forth. So we, this is a long running effort. We've got to push our politicians to do better, but we also have to push ourselves, our teachers, everyone in society to do better in terms of talking about our history forthrightly and honestly. I have a question, if I may. Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, one of the things that is not mentioned very much, uh, and I think you alluded to it uh, tonight, is just how violent politics were, uh, was practiced in South Carolina at the end of Reconstruction and the beginning of the nadir. And uh, we know about the Hamburg massacre, the Ellington and, and all of that, but just uh, county by county, if you look at the lives that were lost just for being in a particular party, uh, could, you, could you speak to that, please? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. And with talking about the lives lost during the reconstruction period, Historians are fairly convinced it's in the thousands um, in terms of, of African Americans and to a lesser extent white Republicans who were killed in South Carolina and across the South. In many ways, the Reconstruction period was actually a second civil war. It, it was just more on a level of an insurgency than anything else. And so we historians will admit that we don't really have an accurate number today of how many died, but I will give you one number. I, I think Robert Smalls himself gave a speech in 1895 where he said he thought the casualties were in the range of, I think, 50 to 60,000 that were lost, which is an astounding number when you consider this was, a rel this was supposed to be peacetime. But like you said, the Reconstruction era was incredibly violent, and we really have not reckoned with that violence in a, in a, in a fully accountable manner. So it's, uh, it's about nine o'clock. So Brett, do you want us to think we should wrap up now? Robert, if the people aren't like popping to know something, maybe ready, they may be ready to ponder what we've laid out before them. And this is not supposed to be necessarily like in, you know, the sugar to make things go down. But I think that the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to give you the capability of being able to act through the bitterness in a strategic fashion that will be able to make and sustain change. So bear with us. And I really do appreciate you being here because this would be really boring if you weren't.
And so we're going to come back next Monday now. Next Monday um, is going to be Vernon Burton, who Vernon, amazing fellow who um, the, 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 the Bible of Ben Tillman is called Pitchfork Ben Tillman. And it was written by a guy named Simpkins of all strange kind of coincidences a long time ago. And in its most recent printing, Vernon wrote the introduction to the Bible of Ben Tillman. And so that, that introduction it will be, it's in your reading. I'll make sure I send it out to, to prep you for it. But uh, Vernon's going to be with us for what we call the deeper dive. And so he'll talk for, I, he, he doesn't want to go on for too long. He's at maybe 40 minutes. And then we'll have a discussion. So it's going to be not, a, not the class structured system that we're, we're having now is class two. It's a specific time period between 1800 and 1865. So these deeper dives are looking at a specific time with a person that can bring some you know, light to that thing. And so do remember that this is a, that the Ben Tillman, the Constitution of 1895 is the one we're still operating under. So it's not an excuse we still like got white racists running the show. It's built into the system. So stay tuned, y'all. Seth, you wait, you gotta say something, bro. You gotta yes. unmute yourself. Personal privilege, please. It won't take but two seconds. Look for it. Hello, Becky. Can she hear me? Hello, Becky. She can hear you. Hello, Marjorie. <laughs> Miss you guys. Well, Seth, let me tell you, we're having a meeting Thursday with Gilda Cobb Hunter and the new Progressive Legislative Caucus that we've resurrected after the death and the loss of Clementa Pinckney and after the death and loss of Joe Neal and after your loss and David Mack's loss. We got some young new black legislators that we don't want to lose. And if somebody, there's nobody there to lead them. And Gilda has quit the Democratic Caucus, the, the Black Caucus. And she says, if y'all want to play with me, it's by invitation only. And so we're playing some hardball. And I'm going, I'm going to get you kind of a gift pass to uh, come to the Progressive Legislative Caucus on your, emer on your emeritus rank. But, but when you use the word, the term loss, you may be left. I, I retired. I didn't lose anything. <laughs> District 113 um, is not, I'm not there representing, but it's still a little bit. Brother, man, I happen to know you're, you're younger than I am. So get off that old, old people club. So I'm going to say goodbye, y'all, and let's all clap and have a good time because it's the beloved community that Gene Hammock talked about. We need to be with people that agree with us and understand why we're who we are. So thank you all. Seth, thank you for your service, and thanks for remembering Point. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Robert. And if uh, Lewis Burke is still with us out there somewhere, thank you, Lewis, so much. We'll be in touch. Stay tuned, folks.